In the grey light of a chill November day, Geoffrey Key climbs the stairs to his attic studio. He crosses the floor and sits at a chair before a blank canvas perched on an easel. He stares at the canvas, then selects a brush and dips it in a pot of browned liquid. Reaching forwards, he begins a series of rapid but sure strokes. And that is where the magic begins. Geoffrey Key's career as a professional artist spans over 60 years. In this film, Geoffrey takes us on a journey to the locations that inspired his work and talks in depth and intimately about the places, people and experiences which have made him the artist he has become. The story begins, like many other good stories, over a bottle of wine in a central Manchester restaurant. Oh, bless you. Thank you very much. That looks lovely. I, I, I do not have to project my <laughs> voice. <laughs> Our art has always been at the forefront. So I've gone through life with blinkers on, really. Were there sort of any particular influences? Were there things that you saw and thought, I want to do that, or...? I've always tried in my life to do a, a, an honest picture, and I've never really relied on somebody else. Um, my mother used to take me to um, uh, the various art galleries in Manchester, and. Uh, and there was one painting actually in the City Art Gallery, and I cannot remember the name of the artist. It's a huge picture of a, a chariot race. And it's only a few years ago that I realized that um, this chariot race had been implanted. And I think that accounts for a lot of the equestrian wow. pictures that I've done. Because every, everything comes from something seen, you know. Um, but it can become somewhat cancerous, mm. if that's the right word. Um, you know, you could be painting and you, you find yourself doing a, a little trick that you've seen somewhere else. Geoffrey Key was born in 1941 in a war-torn Manchester. His mother Marion was a talented amateur artist and he vividly recalls amongst his early memories his sense of joy at the smell of paint being mixed in the kitchen of his childhood home. The person was pointing me in the right direction all the time was my mother. Um, because she was a frustrated artist when she was young. She couldn't afford to go to art college because then you had to pay. So she, she used to take me into Platfields Park, sketching. She sketched with you? She did indeed. She did watercolours. Geoffrey's mother Marion was the most important thing in his life at the time, and the first significant influence in his development as a young artist. In a lot of the early pictures I did, that was quite prominent uh, at Flat Church which is, uh, it's all terracotta. A key feature of Platfields Park was the local church, and Geoffrey recalls that after a summer shower, its terracotta spire would sparkle in the summer sun. It's fantastic. It's the 
appear almost as though the thing was covered in gold leaf. It was absolutely stunning. Um, very different now. Very different now. It was perhaps these trips to Platt Fields that instilled in Geoffrey the desire to become an artist. She was really sort of um, the most important thing in my, in my life at that time. I mean, uh, uh, she used to bring me to sketching here um, because the house where we lived is only about 500 yards across the way there. And, uh, and I also, at that time, got quite an interest in wild fowl because of the lake. Oh, we, we could stand up in turn. That's it. it, it I'm sorry, it was the thespian oh, coming no, out. Well, <laughs> oh, did you, did you used to be a thespian? Did you used to <laughs> it's Lidl there. <laughs> Finding yourself is very difficult. Now, when I was at college, uh, I mean, I was totally influenced by um, uh, Harry Rutherford, who was, who was one of my, my tutors. And when I left college, I, I, I was doing these very dark, tonal pictures, uh, which I was, I was pleased with, uh, but it wasn't totally me. So I, I concentrated on um, spending, well, I didn't time it, but it turned out to be roughly a year, painting this one hill in Glossop called the Nab. From that, uh, it did burn off this, this influence and I ended up with um, pretty close to what I wanted for myself. From where I, I lived in Glossop, it looked like a vertical shape and either side of that was small villages, copses of trees, over on the far side there, looking across at the, at the hill. And that huge scoop uh, became almost like a silhouette against the, um, the sky. And then in front of this was sort of a small copse of trees and bushes and what have you. And they did metamorphosize in, in, into sort of figures. And, um, and that's when the figures crept in. Geoffrey's repeated painting of the Nam brought about a remarkable metamorphosis. Not only in the style of his painting, but also in the Nab itself. These abstracted forms eventually morphed into figures. interlocking figures to begin with, and then they became separate entities. And, and that's how all my figure painting basically started. Geoffrey abstracted the natural formations of the nab into horizontal and curved shapes. But perhaps the most prominent development in the feature was the emergence of the strong horizontal line a feature which is remarked upon in his later work. At that point I hadn't noticed I was doing that, um, but that really is a, you know, sort of, it's harking back to, to the nab. So the ghost of the nab it's, it's there. can be discerned in the yeah, later stuff? Yeah, I've, it's, it's still with me, <laughs> whether I like it or not. <laughs> But in Geoffrey's subconscious, it wasn't only the nab figures that emerged from his landscapes. One day, I, I, I was working on landscape at the time, and, and I was just doodling. And I wasn't actually thinking about what I was doing. And then I sort of looked at the paper, and I'd done a series of clown heads. And I thought, God, where's that? And then, and then I remembered, all these past memories of clowns and what have you, and uh, where I used to hide behind the seat when I went to the circus when the clowns came on. There was the Jester series, then the Clown series, 
and then the Commedia dell'arte series. And all three have got the same thing in common. It's, it's happiness, it's humour, it's fun. I'd reached roughly the end of, of, of the, the series and I did this Piero holding, well not holding, but releasing yeah. a blackbird. With my <laughs> fear of um, clowns when I was a child, because that's the whole reason why I painted them. It was as though that was sort of the, the cure. I, I'd, right. I'd taken all that fear away and, and just released the black bird. So the thing that talks about joy actually starts with fear. Yes. But I've always liked the light things in life, not the heavy, you know. When uh, Judith was still alive, bless her, she became an incredibly important element in my life. Um, Judith and I, we, we, we were like Siamese twins, you know. Uh, we worked together as a team and uh, she sort of um, did the, the promotion side of my work in a very sensitive fashion. And, and I say the, the books she produced are superb, and um, and and I miss her sort of. Um, well, I miss her. Yeah. I never paint direct from life. Um, I've said this many times to people, it was the only way I can uh, say it. It's like if I do a, a still life and, and I set up a group of objects, I look at it for a, a period of time and then put those objects away and then paint it. And, and it's based on a distilled memory where the mind has got a fantastic way of simplifying the construction of things. I honestly, when I'm, when I'm tattling something like a horse picture, I don't actually physically sort of or mentally think of the colours involved. I put down what I feel is right. Geoffrey continues each day to climb the stairs to his attic studio where he sits in front of an easel and paints something new. Geoffrey believes inspiration flows through work, not the other way around. And after 60 years, the inspiration continues to grow. And I guess, I suppose, that's helped you to be what you are, which is to paint what at that moment interests you and not be affected by market or social mores or anything. Well, I've never been affected by the market. Um, I was affected originally by education because I, I started life off after leaving college as a teacher. Uh, it reached a point where something had to go. It was either teaching or painting. 
and, uh, and being completely and utterly selfish, I, I chose painting. And it's just gone on ever since. That was in the 70s, you know. And 60 years on, you're yeah. still I'm, I'm pushing still, new boundaries. I'm still pushing. <laughs> picture was going to be. I just set to it. And, I mean there's a, there's a white bird but it's actually based on, on my my little uh, hen blackbird that visits me every morning. I know it sounds stupid but I, I feed it cheese and it's... <laughs> <laughs> it may have followed me. Prehistoric societies it would be a spirit bird. That's it. But anyway to my white black dog. Two patients from the same family in England have tested positive for coronavirus. A SARS-like virus, virus which has infected all over the world, we're seeing the devastating impact of this airports. invisible the killer. The virus the has mutated. I mean, you know, it's in, in the community, putting health yeah. officials on the first case numbers are expected to rise. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction: you must stay at home. In the November of 2019, we began filming with Geoffrey Key as build-up to the much-anticipated Key Decades exhibition, an exhibition which of course never happened. Now, a couple of birthdays and a pandemic later, we were able to sit down with Geoffrey again to find out how he coped with isolation and how it affected his life, and more importantly, his art. The problem was I wasn't seeing anybody, but to a certain extent, it, it, it's just an extension of my studio life. In general, I'm usually in the studio on my own, because I'm, I, I never have people in the studio when I'm painting. But after that, you leave the studio and you go downstairs. Yeah, well, obviously, yes, I, I'm, I'm then totally alone. Yeah, which, uh, it's all right, the company's good. Isolated in his studio, Jeffrey embarked upon one of his most poignant series, The Isolated Heads. But when did you become conscious that this was something different as a series? Well, it kicked off when you filmed me doing that figure. Three or four days later, I had a blank canvas and just from a subconscious did this head, which led onto another head and then onto another head until 30 pictures were uh, produced. And the, the 30th one, I, I felt that I'd said what I wanted to say. As I say, the whole thing was um, a subconscious reaction to being sort of isolated because the, the only people I was meeting were the, were the ones I was creating on canvas, you know. During lockdown, Jeffrey's painting flourished. But other aspects of his artistic endeavours remain shrouded and shut down. Mm. 
Now for the first time in almost three years, he returns to his sculpture studio. We return to the studio later, but first, once more and long overdue, we sit down with Geoffrey for a meal and a glass of wine. very difficult to eat this elegantly. I do not set out with an intention and try to fulfill it. What I do is I paint and at the end of the day, if I'm happy with that and I've got what I want to say, fair enough. To Jeffrey, the artistic process is largely subconscious. In his own words, when one thinks too much about a painting, one risks destroying what they're trying to do. Well, a thought is important. One doesn't just willy-nilly set about doing a painting with no thought at all. What I try to do is paint what I feel is a feeling of happiness, beauty, and I think that's that is important. Perhaps this is why, when looking back at a body of work spanning over 60 years, we see a subject matter that is so widely diverse, and yet an individual style that transcends throughout. You reach a point where things are happening subconsciously, and that's when important things happen. You, you reach this point where you're painting away, you're on a different planet. It, it just, it happens. You know, it's, it's, to me it's magic. Geoffrey Key recognises a trip to Hong Kong in the early 1990s as a seminal step in his development as an artist. The transformation of his use of colour. When I was offered this exhibition in Hong Kong, uh, going out there and seeing colour for the first time, because prior to that, if I'd gone abroad, uh, it was to northern European places like Holland, Germany, France. So I'd, I'd never seen light as it is. Just getting off that plane in Hong Kong and seeing this light and colour and how shadows formed I mean, here, if you get a shadow from a building, it's a muted thing. There, with that strong sunlight, it's very, it's dark and light. Reds are pillar box red, and it, it's incredible. Jeffrey distinguishes between his use of colour before visiting Hong Kong to his use of colour after Hong Kong. That I hadn't orchestrated. That happened because I'd gone to Hong Kong. So this is this is breakfast, isn't it? It is indeed breakfast. The last day. How do you think it's gone so far, Jeffrey? Okay? It's damn good. Mm. 
Jeffrey's highly distinctive style has rendered him one of Britain's most popular artists. <laughs> Being a victim of his own success, his work sells rapidly, and the Isolated Head series is no exception to this. I thought what would be a lovely thing to do before the pictures disappeared would be to produce a book. And very beautiful it is too. I'm glad you're pleased with it. <laughs> and I thought what would be a, a sort of a double whammy is, is, is to call the book Isolated Heads, because I did all these heads in isolation. And in those 30 faces, we can all find something we can connect with. I mean, that's us. You've drawn all of us during COVID. Yeah, people have mentioned, you know, particular pictures that had meaning to them, which is wonderful, really, yeah. Involved in these pictures, I, I, I had them holding various sort of urns or vessels, which then slowly became green plant. And then the number 30, the, the, the final one, uh, the plant flowered. So one felt as though one had survived this period, yeah. statement. It did? Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Um, and hopefully people will get some sort of memory from it, you know, it's, yeah. um, because it, it's, we've gone through, it's been horrible, but it's been a, a memorable period. It's it? been a once in a lifetime, hopefully. Yeah, 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 yeah hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Some weeks since our first visit, we return to Geoffrey's sculpture studio. But there's been a transformation. With Geoffrey's sculptures now cleaned up and restored, we gaze upon a very different scene. What was a natural thing to me was to actually go into three dimension, because I thought, it's going to be highly constructive, relevant to painting. In fact, a lot of people have said that my, my paintings, uh, especially figures and what have you, do look sculptural. Looking back, Geoffrey credits some of his finest figure paintings to his early appreciation of the three-dimensional form, which have stemmed directly from his early essays in sculpture. And I was very much into sort of figure work because of the I was still getting over the, the series of uh, sculpture works of mm. when I was in college. Because when you're painting, if, if you're aware of the back of something as well as the front, it does help in giving a three-dimensional optical illusion but when you're painting on a flat surface. People have tried carving for the first time, tend to fight the wood. You, you, you go with the timber and it's a wonderful feeling because you, you can look at a piece of uh, timber and it will all automatically dictate what's inside that piece of timber. And, and in this one, that's a knot hole in the timber, but it, it, it just looked like a navel. So the whole thing grew from that. A dead piece of wood, there was a knot there where some insects had got in, and it was just rotten. So I cut it out and just, well, it's a piece of mahogany now. Remember it was that? That's the only piece of sculpture I've done this year. These are, are based on, on fungi and plant forms. This is one I've used metal studs in, in these sort of flower heads. 
Well, this is harking back to the early lab paintings where the, the forms uh, form these things what people call flowers. So they're a step on yeah. the route to your lab creatures. That's it. The one at the top, that's one of your flower series. That's one of the flower series, which again, sort of six and six. The, the nab sort of shape, which is indicated by that um, strong horizontal sort of horizon. Mm. Um, uh, the, the flowers, in actual fact, were an extension of, of, of the figure shapes. And this is, is one. Uh, based on the nab itself, the, the field shapes. So is, is that the only carving of the nab you did? So yeah. that, that's unique? Yeah, yeah well, that, that's it. As Judith was saying, it was based on a, one of the northern sort of Celtic heads, but mm. was one of my heads. But, uh, Who knows? There were exactly. Who were anyway. Right. In the weeks leading up to the Key Decades exhibition, the true extent of the task of curation begins to dawn. This is the easy stage, which all the big stuff gets here. This is the uh, this is the, the manageable paintings. You've got rare things that have disappeared from view. Yeah. You've got stuff that sort of challenge the canon, like the thing with that big orange thing that's very early. The, yeah. thing, the thing about colour. You dug stuff out. Big orange thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I, you, I'm sound, not, you sound like Sir Kenneth Clark. I'm an artificial <laughs> Jeffrey. It's a determinist technica. That's, that's what we say in the business. Big orange thing. As preparation begins, we get our first tantalising glimpse as the story of six decades begins to reveal itself. That distinctive horizontal line, that in a way is blanking everything out, isn't it? In, in, yes. In that line, he's killing off his past, and yet out of that line grows all the stuff that we see coming. And yet, at the same time, he's doing this. Even though he's muted to stuff earlier on, he's a bright character, isn't he? And he wrote the news yeah, yeah. And that certainly does scream a Geoffrey Key, even that early on. Put those together and then put them against some of his later stuff, like the later dances, and you've, what a journey he's gone on. The one thing that is going to be different about this exhibition, he's held a lot of exhibitions in his in his career, hasn't he? And all those people have a preconception yeah, of yeah. what they're going to be seeing, and they're not going to be seeing that at all. Exactly, and this is an exhibition that will strip those preconceptions away. I think. Yeah. Actually, even if you're one of Jeff's legions of fans, mm. there's things in here that are going to surprise you. Yeah. yeah. Your palette looks a little bit in need of a change, is that? How long uh, has that been going on? Well, that, that, that's my new palette. That's my old palette. I, I started that when I was at college, and, and that went right through to the sort of, um, uh, about the eight is that, yes. <laughs> Nine times out of ten, I'm just so pleased to see that these pictures have survived for a start. And uh, not only that, but I'm, I'm proud of what's there. But the way I've worked since leaving college, everything has been in one long chain of progression. Each thing has led on to the next. 
Geoffrey Key's life as an artist spans a period of considerable change, beginning with post-war austerity, then taking in the surge towards freedom and youth culture of the 60s, economic and social disorder, war, the restructuring of world order, pandemic and lockdown. Encapsulated within six decades of work, we see a story that presents not only success and achievement, but the struggle and beauty of something hard won, impossible to imitate, constantly renewing and progressing, something that has endured and will continue to delight and surprise us all. Jeffrey King.